Today at one, a small tornado rips through parts of Greater Manchester, damaging homes as Storm Garrett sweeps across the country. Police declare a major incident in Thameside after roofs are torn off houses, trees blown down and walls collapse. The Hamas-run health ministry says 50 people have been killed in Gaza as Israel continues its ground offensive. Inside the world's tallest wood turbine, we find out how renewable energy just got greener. And the confidential government papers which reveal how one former Premier League side nearly relocated to Belfast. Around 100 homes have been damaged by a small tornado in Greater Manchester as Storm Garrett swept across the country. Police have declared a major incident in Thameside after roofs were torn off houses, trees blew down and walls collapsed. Elsewhere in the UK, Storm Garrett has brought flooding and disrupted travel. It's Scotland that's been worst affected. Thousands of homes are still without power and two major roads are closed because of flood water and fallen trees. Our correspondent Fiona Trott is in Millbrook, where the mini tornado struck. Fiona. Well, residents on this street were evacuated from their homes just minutes after it happened, and they've come back here today to take a look at the place where they used to live, and they've been confronted with the reality, the impact of what's been described as that localised tornado, and it suddenly hit them. Cars smashed. Roofs smashed, leads, which you couldn't normally pick up, has just been blown off houses. You can see a piece of it probably hanging on an overhead cable there behind me. Um, I've spoken to people living in this street, and they described hearing a loud roaring sound last night. They say that the houses shook, there was hail. Uh, they thought it was an earthquake, but it lasted for just 30 seconds, they say. But, but look at all the damage. Uh, that it caused. So they just grabbed what belongings they could, they grabbed their pets and they left. Some of them have been staying with friends, some of them have been staying with relatives, some of them have been staying at a local rest centre. Um, they keep coming back here and asking the police if they can go back inside. They're very anxious about that, but that may take some time. And that's because Greater Manchester Police say this this afternoon, our highest priority is keeping people safe and advising those who've been displaced not to return or enter their properties which have significant damage until they've been assessed properly by structural engineers. So while they wait, while they plan where they're going to be sleeping for the coming days and weeks, um, they are telling us that they just feel lucky and are amazed that nobody was hurt. The moment their lives turned upside down. It's been described as a localised tornado. It lasted for seconds, but the impact was devastating. Here in Millbrook, a lucky escape. This tree smashed through a house just metres from where a woman slept. He was to get a wrecking ball and go through a house. It was like, because I opened the door and I thought, oh my God. Maisie hasn't slept a wink. She has no idea what will happen to her home. What seems to have happened is the trees hit the roof and um, gone through my bathroom. So the whole roof and ceiling of my bathroom is down. The tree is in the bathroom. Um, and there's, the whole tree is being held up by one branch and it's starting to snap currently, I've been told. So if it does snap, it's going to go through the whole house. A scene from a movie. That's how they described it here in Staley Bridge. It's amazing that nobody was seriously injured. Tornadoes have been massively damaging. You can see winds in excess of 100 miles an hour concentrating on a very small area, but that is enough to bring down parts of houses, trees, cause massive amounts of damage. In Scotland, the Shetland Isles were hit by winds of over 80 miles an hour last night. And across the whole of Scotland, more than 7,000 homes are still without power. Fiona Trott, BBC News, Staley Bridge. Let's take you to our reporter Ian McGuinness, who is in Fort Augustus, home still without power. When are residents likely to get power back, Ian? 
Lucy, after a day of widespread disruption yesterday, it really is a clean-up sort of day today. Uh, much of that weather that battered uh, Scotland has passed through, although we are left with plenty of rain and plenty of disruption, uh, as Fiona said in her report there. Between seven and 8,000 homes still without power, including around 1,000 here in the Highlands. The village of Fort Augustus affected. We're hearing just in the last half hour or so that some of these homes in the village itself have been reconnected. But down the Glen and other parts of rural Scotland, there are still homes without power. Uh, and we're being told it could be well into tomorrow until those homes are reconnected, given some of the, the major issues that we've seen on the roads network. Now, we have been hearing about flooding also in Fife that affected some homes in Cooper yesterday. So there is a clean-up operation underway in that part of the world. And obviously, um, the snow had a major impact yesterday on the A9, where a major incident was declared. Some folk were caught in their cars for over six hours uh, in that snow. But the snow has gone, more or less, as quickly as it came. That road is now clear, and folk are able to travel up and down it. But there are still issues on some of Scotland's major roads. Uh, route, route between Inverness and Aberdeen is, due, uh, is uh, actually flooded at the moment at Huntley and is closed. And also the main route here between Inverness and Fort William uh, is blocked with trees on the route. And uh, it's obviously a major challenge for folk trying to travel uh, around this time of Hogmanay and New Year. Ian, thank you. Israel has said it will intervene in southern Lebanon to push back Hezbollah fighters unless the government there reigns them in. Escalating clashes on Israel's northern border with Lebanon have led to concerns the conflict in Gaza between Hamas and Israel could widen. Both Hamas and Hezbollah are designated as terrorist organizations by many Western states and the UK. Here's our Middle East correspondent, Yelena. Bundles of joy in a time of anguish. Iman al Mosri tends to three of her quadruplets, recently born in one of Gaza's overwhelmed hospitals. One remains in intensive care. Miles away from their home and with supplies short, Iman and her husband fear for the safety of their newborns in this UN school turned shelter. Because there's a lack of baby formula, I try to breastfeed them, but there's no nutritious food I can eat, Iman explains. Disposable nappies aren't available, so I only change them three times a day. Children continue to suffer in this brutal war. Little Nahum doesn't yet know her mother's been killed in an Israeli airstrike. Medics here in Khen Yunis battle to save lives close to the southern front line of the fighting. Israeli ground forces are pushing into areas they say are strongholds of Hamas and targeting its command centers. The military says this tunnel network in northern Gaza was miles long. It's now being destroyed. But increasingly, Israel's attention is not just focused on the war in Gaza, but on its northern border with Lebanon, where there are almost daily exchanges of fire with the powerful Iran-backed armed group Hezbollah. Sirens send Israelis in northern towns rushing to shelters. Yesterday saw some of the heaviest incoming rocket fire since tensions surged in October. Hezbollah aims to tie up Israel's military resources that could otherwise be deployed in Gaza. Israeli ministers warn it's a dangerous strategy. The situation on Israel's northern border demands change. The stopwatch for a diplomatic solution is running out. If the world and the Lebanese government don't act in order to prevent the firing on Israel's northern residents and to distance Hezbollah from the border, Israel will do it. As Israeli fighter jets strike in southern Lebanon in response to the latest missile fire, a grim pattern repeats itself. But the fear is that this could yet slip into another devastating all-out war. Yolanda Nell, BBC News, Jerusalem. A murder inquiry is underway after a 46-year-old man died. Several others were injured when a car hit a crowd of people outside a property in the Burngreave area of Sheffield yesterday afternoon. A 23-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder, and a second man, aged 55, was arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. Both are in custody. The NHS have launched a new campaign, and it features the former footballer David James, urging people to stop smoking. Research suggests teenagers are more than three times as likely to smoke if their parents, caregivers or friends do. Anita Country has more for us. Literally one cigarette 
got me addicted for 15 years. In this campaign, former England goalkeeper David James joins other ex-smokers and health professionals. He says his children are one of the main reasons he stopped smoking. It's a tough thing to give up, smoking. Um, and I'm not pretending you can just do it without a second thought. And uh, if you get to those tough moments, think about your own health, think about the children, um, and think about the impact that you're having on them in a positive way by not smoking. According to the NHS, about 76,000 people in the UK die every year from a smoking-related illness. It wasn't until I gave up at the age of 30, started training better, not getting out of breath during training sessions, uh, becoming the athlete that I was before I started smoking, uh, that I actually realised that, first of all, smoking wasn't good for me personally. At the moment, you have to be 18 years old to buy cigarettes. In England, the government says it wants to raise the age of people buy them by one year every year, but some critics say it could lead to the creation of a black market. It means anyone who's turned 14 this year or is younger than that won't ever be able to legally buy them. We were able to look at what things made people more likely to start smoking and uh, what we, we, we picked up really strongly was that there was this effect of, of, of parents and, and, and peers. So if, if uh, a teenager's uh, parents or their, um, their, their friends smoke, they're three or, or four times more likely to start smoking than if that isn't the case. A large part of this campaign is to deter young people from taking up the habit, and it also warns against vaping unless it's used as a tool to give up cigarettes. This message is clear, that now's the time to quit. Anise Cardry, BBC News. Wind turbines are normally made from steel, but now a turbine made of wood has begun supplying electricity to the Swedish electricity grid. And the company which has built the 150-metre-high structure say it's more environmentally friendly and that wooden towers could end up being taller than those made of steel. Our environment correspondent, Jonah Fisher, was the first journalist to be allowed a visit. Having brought us ABBA, meatballs and flat pack furniture, from Sweden comes another innovation that just might change the way we generate electricity. Welcome to the world's tallest wind turbine tower made out of wood. Currently, almost all of the world's turbines are steel, which is usually made by burning fossil fuels. Steel is great material, right? But steel is very heavy. And with this material, we can perform the same task, but with 30% less weight and with more than 100% less carbon emissions. We're the first journalists invited inside for a closer look. Wind power is already one of the cheapest and cleanest ways to generate electricity. Using wood could make it even greener. I'm now 105 metres up at the very top of the tower. These blades are like almost all wind turbines made out of fiberglass. The generator that I'm standing on is primarily made of steel. But the company who has built the wooden tower say that by making the tower out of wood, it's storing carbon dioxide. It's carbon negative. And it's that carbon dioxide that's warming our planet. But this isn't only about being greener. To reach stronger and more consistent winds, turbines need to get even taller. And that means bigger, and wider turbine towers. Getting those massive pieces of steel on site by road is already a major headache. And that's where wooden towers just might come in. There's a huge amount of potential in this. That's because the towers are modular. At a factory in Gothenburg, more than a hundred thin sheets of wood are glued together to make the wall sections. Those modular pieces can then be more easily taken to the turbine site. We do not bolt our towers or screw them together. We, we glue them together, right? And wood and glue is a perfect combination. So is it all just a bit of a gimmick? Well, maybe not. The project is being backed by Investus, the world's largest installer of wind power. And they told us that using wood could end up solving some of the industry's transport problems in a more environmentally sustainable way. Jonah Fisher, BBC News, in Gothenburg, in Sweden.
Vinyl records are continuing to make a huge comeback with UK sales up by nearly 12%. Taylor Swift's 1989 was the best-selling LP, followed by the Rolling Stones' Hackney Diamonds. Despite more than four-fifths of recorded music being consumed by streaming, vinyl sales are now at their highest level since 1990. Newly released government papers show how the then Prime Minister Tony Blair was keen on an idea to relocate Wimbledon Football Club, who at the time were playing in the English Premier League and based in South West London, to Belfast in Northern Ireland. The team would have been renamed Belfast United, as our correspondent Mark Simpson reports. A brand new sports stadium in Belfast with a Premier League football team. That was the plan 25 years ago to help bring people together as the peace process improved. The idea of turning Wimbledon FC into Belfast United FC was discussed openly at the time. What the state papers released today show is the extent of the political discussions behind the scenes. There certainly were differences of opinion on that. Mo Mollum, as Secretary of State, was not keen on the idea. In fact, she, she used the phraseology that she didn't think it was a particularly safe proposal. By contrast, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, was extremely enthusiastic, and he wrote in the middle of July 1998 that he thought it would be excellent if Wimbledon moved to Belfast and that the government should try to do everything to make that happen. In the end, of course, it didn't happen. The building of sports stadiums is still a topic of debate these days, as is Loch Ney, and it too cropped up in the old government files. In 1958, it was discussed as the site for a nuclear power plant. Loch Ney, sports stadiums, and disagreements between politicians. These old files show how the present can have echoes of the past. Mark Simpson, BBC News, Belfast. Time for a look at the all-important weather. Louise Lear is with us. How's it looking, Louise? Well, Storm Garrett certainly made for challenging uh, conditions, didn't it? If you are visiting friends and family on your way home, and an early heads up if you're off again this weekend for the New Year's Eve celebrations, there's another potential low pressure which could make for some pretty travelling, uh, challenging conditions as well. Heavy rain, maybe even some snow through northern England at lower levels along with Scotland as well, and widespread gale force gusts of winds. More on that in just a moment. Storm Garrett has now moved off into Scandinavia, but we're still under the influence of this low pressure. The isobars squeezing together. The winds have been a feature this morning. Gusts in excess of 50 to 70 miles an hour. And yes, we've got further rumbles of thunder and lightning through Wales and northwest England. So that rain is going to drift its way steadily eastwards. We'll see a line of potent showers through Lincolnshire down into the Midlands, down towards the southwest. Again, narrow off and probably not arrive into London till after dark. Plenty of showers into Scotland and Northern Ireland. Gusty winds as well. Perhaps lighter winds in Scotland, but certainly noticeable winds quite widely across the country. That might make it feel just that little bit cooler than these temperatures suggest, but they're still on the mild side for the bulk of us. 11 to 13 degrees, a little bit cooler in the far north of Scotland. That cold air sits in place through the night, and with a northerly wind, we could see some of those showers is turning wintry to higher ground. There will be further showers across Northern Ireland and Northern England and a spell of very wet weather easing away from South East England as well. So as we go into Friday, we can split the country into three on the whole. Cold start with some wintry showers into Northern Scotland, rain or sharper showers into Northern Ireland and Northern England. And with a westerly wind feeding in some showers across southwest England and Wales, which will gradually drift their way steadily south and east as we go through the afternoon. Here's our highs, 5 to 11 degrees. Now, as we move out of Friday into the start of the weekend, this is what I was talking about. Here's the next area of low pressure, once again bringing some very wet weather as it pushes its way steadily north. As it bumps into that cold air, that's where we could see some snow in Scotland and perhaps into northern England. Widespread gale force gusts of winds, pretty miserable conditions for trying to get from A to B on Saturday. That low pressure will gradually start to move its way steadily eastward, so a miserable Saturday night into Sunday. Sunday, of, of course, New Year's Eve. But it does mean for Scotland a slightly quieter day, potentially on New Year's Eve. Sharp showers and blustery winds elsewhere. Don't expect much change for New Year's Day as well. It stays unsettled and a little cooler. Lucy. Louise, thank you. And that's BBC News at One.
News continues here on BBC One, as now it's time to join our colleagues across the nations and regions. For the news, where you are. Goodbye.